Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Galatians as we begin a chapter-by-chapter -chapter study through this marvelous book I refer to as the gift of grace. Paul writes to the churches in Galatia. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible reads like this from the New Living Translation. This letter is from Paul, an apostle. I was appointed not by any group of people or any human authority. No, my appointment came by Christ himself and by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. All the brothers and sisters here join me in sending this letter to the churches in Galatia. Well, we know as we just completed a extensive study through the book of Acts, 28 chapters, the story of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus, Acts chapter 9, and then how he would teach in Antioch with Barnabas, and then in Acts chapter 13, the Holy Spirit would speak, and they would be anointed to go out on the world's first missionary journey. That would be Paul and Barnabas. Now, on this first missionary journey, in Acts chapter 13 and 14, we read all about the establishing of the churches throughout Asia Minor. Paul is later going to refer to this area and these churches as Galatia. There are over 12 specific churches that Paul established in the book of Acts that are identified in these stories, Acts 13, 14, and 16. Now, when we come to the second missionary journey in Acts chapter 16, the Holy Spirit is going to close the door in Galatia region, lead Paul across the Aegean Sea to Macedonia, where there in Philippi, he will begin a new work, a new church. He will travel south through Brea, Thessalonica, and of course, Athens, until finally he arrives at the city of Corinth. This is all on his second missionary journey. Paul spends a considerable amount of time in Corinth in his second missionary journey. This is the location that Paul is going to write his very first letter that we have recorded in the New Testament. It works historically something like this. In 45 AD, Paul set out on his first missionary journey. In 50 AD, he set out on his second missionary journey. And now it's a couple of years past that beginning of being on the second missionary journey that Paul begins writing this letter in the Bible called Galatians down in Corinth across the Aegean Sea. It's about the year 52 AD. What does that all mean? That means that if Christ was crucified in the year 30 or 33 AD, you come forward about 20 years, and we have not only the birth and the growth of the early church, we have the very first letter that was written to the early church by the Apostle Paul. When we read Galatians chapter 1, it is packed with revelation of the challenges and the struggles that the early church was experiencing. And today, 2,000 years later, we read the book of Galatians and realize the challenges and struggles that churches in America and around the world are still struggling with. Let's look together at the New Living Translation, Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, very carefully. 
this letter is from the Apostle Paul. I was not appointed by any group of people or any human authority. You recall the story of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. It's found in Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and following. It says, as Luke, the author of the book of Acts, wrote, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. He was zealous. He was passionate about destroying the early church in Acts chapter 9. Of course, his name is referred to as Saul before his conversion and becoming a great missionary. Well, Paul went to the high priest in Acts 9. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way. In other words, any believer of the Lord Jesus Christ that he found there. He wanted to bring them back to Jerusalem, men and women. He wanted to bring them back in shackles to the city of Jerusalem, where they would be tried, judged, and punished, even possibly put to death. The Bible says in Acts chapter 9, verse 3, as Paul was approaching the city of Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. Paul fell to the ground, and he heard the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ calling him out by name. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Acts chapter 9 is the exciting, dramatic story of the conversion of Saul giving his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. But that, of course, is not the end of the story. This is the part where Paul becomes a believer and he is called not by man or human authority, but by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now in Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, that's exactly what Paul is referring to. I was not appointed by any group. I was not appointed by any person or any human authority. And yes, in Acts 13, men moved by the Holy Spirit laid hands on the Apostle Paul and they would be sent out, he and Barnabas, to become the world's first missionary. But Paul doesn't even acknowledge that here. He focuses in on the appointment, the authority, the anointing that comes from heaven. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. And that's what Paul writes, chapter 1, verse 1 of the book of Galatians. Oh, brothers and sisters that are right here with me, and he's referring to Corinth. We are sending these letters, this letter, to the brothers and sisters, to all the churches in Galatia. One of the things that we recognize already is that he's writing a single letter to at least a dozen different churches that we know about. It's very likely there could have been 24 or 36 or 48 churches that he was actually writing to in present-day Turkey that he calls Galatia. But here's the key. When he wrote this letter, it's for the entire body of Christ. It's for you and me. It's for the entire church. And the message, the message that we're going to discover is the gift of grace. I like to think of it like this in my prayer journal. God provides the grace and we respond by faith or with faith. 
Now, I think Galatians is one of the most important books in all of the New Testament, in all of the Bible. The first reasons why I believe that is because it's the first letter written to the early New Testament church. And in it, the second reason why I believe it's so important is that it addresses the early struggles and challenges of the early New Testament church, which has to do with salvation by the gift of God, grace, or salvation by works of righteousness, those things you do. Some speak of works as man reaching up to heaven, where is grace, God reaching down to earth. The next reason why I feel that Galatians is so very, very significant and important for you and I is because it shows conflict resolution in the early New Testament church. Paul does not sweep conflict under the rug. He draws it out in the six chapters of the book of Galatians, and then he demonstrates or gives to us a beautiful model as to how to deal with conflict in any church, in every church. There are challenges, there are struggles, and he gives to us a model of how to deal with discord, disunity, conflict in the early New Testament church struggle. Lastly, the reason why I believe this book is so very important is because it teaches us our identity in Christ Jesus, how we are a adopted into the family of faith, and that as members of the family of faith, we are guided in the teaching and the writing of the Apostle Paul to be led by the Holy Spirit. There are so many famous theologians that have written about this marvelous book we call Galatians that I refer to as the gift of grace. One wrote that Galatians is the Christian's declaration of independence from the law of Moses, of the legalism of the Jewish tradition. That quote by a scholar named Charles Hodge. John Calvin wrote that Galatians shines bright as a star. Timothy Keller wrote, Galatians offers a roadmap to a grace-centered life. A.W. Tozer wrote, the cross and grace are central in the book of Galatians. Galatians declares the transforming power of God's grace. That's a quote from a modern, very, very famous pastor in America today. And another wrote, Galatians leads us into the depths of God's grace. We recognize that in the book of Galatians, it all begins with Paul being called, anointed, being empowered with the authority to being appointed by the Lord Jesus Christ to be that shining star. We recognize that it's the Holy Spirit involved. And in Acts chapter 9, it's Paul meeting face to face the Lord Jesus Christ for his appointment. In Acts chapter 13, it's so fascinating because we see the work of the Holy Spirit. Let me read it to you. Acts 13, verse 1. 
One day as the leaders in Antioch were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them out on the world's first missionary journey. And remember, that was to the region Paul calls Galatia. But recognize in Acts 9, it's Jesus speaking to Paul. In Acts 13, when they're sent out, it's the Holy Spirit poured out on the day of Pentecost. And now in this moment of prayer and fasting and worshiping, God's Holy Spirit speaks to the leadership in the city of Antioch. In Acts chapter 13, Paul is ministering. And it says in verse 46, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly. And they declared that because the Jewish people in the Jewish synagogues rejected the gospel, that is the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, and salvation through the blood of the Lamb, we are going to transition our focus and attention from the Jewish people in the synagogue to the Gentiles in the cities. Everywhere that Paul went on the missionary journey throughout Galatia, he always started with the Jewish people in the Gent in the synagogues. But if and when they rejected the message, he would turn to the city and minister the same message to the Gentiles. In verse 47 of Acts 13, it says, For the Lord gave us this command. The Lord said to us, Paul declared boldly, I have made you a light to the Gentiles. And that light is the message that Christ is the Savior. I have made you the light to the Gentiles to bring salvation to the furthest corners of the entire world. When we come to these six chapters of the book of Galatians, I want to introduce to you a simple outline as you read and study it in your daily devotions as we look at each one of these chapters, verse by verse. First of all, it's so important to recognize Paul sharing his personal dramatic conversion, referring back to Acts chapter 9. But remember, that was some 15, 20 years later that he's writing the book of Galatians. So I want to connect the dots. I want you to read Acts chapter 9 and study and meditate on it carefully. And then come to the book of Galatians. And in the first chapter or two, you will discover in our outline that Paul is sharing his dramatic conversion and how he grows in his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the second part of this outline is how Paul deals with false teachers in the book of Galatians. These are obstacles to the growth of the church. Jesus spoke and gave us the parable of the sower and the seed. And when he did, he spoke about the rocks and the thorns that will come and stunt the growth, and that literally the sea will die off. And that's something we're going to read about in the book of Galatians. And why is that? It's those thorns that choke out our faith of grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is those rocks that are left over in the soil that will stunt the growth and prevent 
our faith, our salvation from blossoming like Christ intended it to. to. Now, let's look at this outline very carefully. Number one, dealing with false teachings, Paul's dramatic conversion. And number three, he addresses salvation by grace with faith. And finally, number four, he introduces to you and I, we're going to study it verse by verse, how and why we are to walk by the Holy Spirit. There are so many powerful verses that you've committed to memory. You've heard someone teaching on these subjects Maybe a pastor you've sat under have been preaching this one or two verses that I want to refer, refer to you. I want to, it to be fresh in your mind as we launch our study in the book of Galatians. For an example, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but it's Christ that dwells or lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. We'll be studying and recognizing the indwelling of Christ inside each of our hearts. You've prayed that prayer. You've had that Born again experience, Paul, that uh, Jesus wrote, uh, spoke about in the book of John, chapter 3, to Nicodemus, being born again. But do you know that the Bible teaches in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, that Christ not only came in your heart, but he dwells within your spirit even today? We'll be looking at that, but underscore it in your Bibles today. We'll be looking at Galatians chapter 3, verse 9. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing of Abraham. The blessing Abraham received because of his faith. Connecting the old covenant to the new covenant. The blessings of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, the just shall live by faith. And Galatians 3, verse 26, for you are each a child of God. You're a son of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And remember Galatians chapter 4, verse 5, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that we could be adopted as his very own child. And because we are his children, that is God's children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father, translated means dear daddy. Now you are no longer a slave to the law to the flesh, or to the world. But you are a child of God. And since you are a child of God, God has made you his heir. And in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, let the Holy Spirit produce this kind of fruit in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. There is no law against any of these things. And in Galatians chapter 6, verse 8, for he who sows to the flesh will reap of the flesh corruption, but he who sows of the Spirit will reap everlasting life. Oh, what a thrill to be reading the book of Galatians. What a thrill to fill our hearts with the word of God. You remember with me in your time of meditation, this book speaks of the gift of grace. 
and that it is God who provides the grace and we who respond with faith in Jesus' name.